Hi there, everyone, and thanks for joining us on KXAN Live. I'm Will Dupree coming to you from the KXAN Live studio. We go live now to a news conference happening with the Lake Travis Fire Rescue. They're talking about wildfire danger in these incredibly hot temperatures and dry conditions we're seeing out there, also sharing ways that you all can stay prepared. Let's listen in as those firefighters discuss this. I specifically want to speak to our community as we ask for help in this season. <clears throat> Why are we here today is one of the questions a lot of people are asking, and what are we doing to prevent and reduce wildland in the area? And there's gonna be a couple topics that we cover today. First, I wanna thank the county commissioners and the Travis County Fire Marshal's office for implementing a burn ban as of this Tuesday that extends to August 17th. By this burn ban being in place, it'll help the first responders in the community have another layer, layer of protection to reduce things that could cause a wildland fire like controlled burning. When the conditions are dry, as we've seen for the last couple of weeks, we know that the risk is very high. In the last couple of weeks, local fire departments within the cities and within the unincorporated areas of Travis County have responded to many wildland fires, some small and some big. The burr bands are precautionary measures to ensure the safety of the community. It's a temporary stopping of things like burning, a, a controlled burning and other things that would normally lead to a wildland fire. We are also monitoring the Keech Byram Drought Index, or affectionately known as the KDBI Index. This index helps us understand the moisture content of the vegetation in and around our community. When the index is low, we have a very low possibility of a wildfire starting, or if it does start, spreading fast. If the index is high, we have a heightened, uh, heightened ability to have a wildfire threaten our properties and threaten our communities. We monitor this throughout the day, each day, and we work with local authorities such as the firefighters and land management resource agencies to determine that level uh, each day and also tailor the responses on a given day to those types of wildland fires. The weather and what to expect, we know it's been hot. It's been hot for many weeks. We have not had significant rain in many weeks. The weather conditions continue and are forecasted to be very dry and very hot for the foreseeable future. We are in July. We have August and we have September. We still have a ways to go. In preparation for response to wildland fires, all of the participating agencies in, in Travis County are part of the auto aid agreement. And what that does is it brings resources, whether from the county or from a city, together on a fire very quickly. We do not have boundaries in the sense of auto aid agreements. We have an incident, fire related, medically related, rescue, whatever the situation may be, and we send the closest unit. And we do that at various levels. We have special equipment to handle wildfires. Throughout, the, throughout Travis County alone, we have eight water tenders, 30 brush trucks, seven quints or ladder trucks, three rescue units, 36 engine companies, and 11 squad resources. Training in wildland firefighting is not a new thing. We've been training for more than 30 years in Travis County for wildfire. Every year we advance that training. We have more firefighters on the front lines to protect the communities and the properties. And we work with our state and federal partners in advancing our preparation every day. Due to long histories of ESDs, emergency service districts, handling the majority of fires, within Travis County, we have developed the County Resource Coordination Program, and that is a focal point to ensure that all the resources within Travis County are being effectively dispatched in a timely manner, and if new resources are needed on an incident, we can easily request uh, more additional resources. We are also part of a statewide Texas Fire Interstate Mutual Aid System, or TIFMIS, and that allows us the ability to call state resources from other departments throughout the state to assist when, when needed. As an example of TIFMIS is we deploy to other parts of the state when we're requested, and an example of when we receive TIFMIS responses and auto aid responses would be the 2011 Stana Ranch fire, where we received resources from throughout the state, as did Bastrop and Spice Loop. What can you do to protect you, your home, and your family from wildfire? First, have an evacuation plan should you need it. Sign up on warrencentraltexas.org for alerts 
and information that can come to your phone or come to your email or receive phone calls uh, specific to your area that you sign up in. That is a free service. Have an evacuation plan for your, for your family. Have a to-go bag, which we have here. And we, we can show you an example of what's in a go bag. A go bag has important documents that you may need. Device charger, so, such as cell phone or uh, device, electronic devices, laptop or uh, iPad type tablet chargers, bottled water, non-perishable food items, prescriptions, personal hygiene items, and some pet supplies. Also, when you're preparing for an evacuation, ensure that you consider special needs that your family may have, young kids, older adults, or anybody with any impairments that need special assistance during an evacuation. How can you prepare your home for the threat of wildfire? And by saying it's never too late, by the end of this, if you spend this weekend doing some of these things around your house, you will have taken measures to improve the resiliency of your house and your property. So let's start. What can you do? The first is home hardening, meaning making your home more resilient to fire by reducing its vulnerability to spreading flames. Home hardening for wildland fires is all about increasing your home's resiliency and giving it a better chance of surviving. So when you consider modifications to your home, such as decking, consider alternative materials other than just wood. If you are going to use wood, ensure that you are um, using stains that are not highly flammable. And there are products out on the market that can reduce the flammability or at least the spread of a fire should you get an ember on your deck, as an example. One of the biggest things and one of the quickest things you can do is simply start cleaning up your properties. Clearing around your home and creating a defensible space is so vitally important. Embers can fly onto your property from far away. You could have a fire down the street or a mile from your house. And embers can find their way to your house, to your gutters, if they're not maintained well and cleaned out, and also to your property lines where the vegetation may be thicker than it is near your house. Def defensible space is already key to properly preparing your house for the threat of wildfire. Ceiling openings. Sealing openings and gaps and vents to prevent embers from entering the home is key. Soffits, roof lines, uh, you may have holes in your, your roof or the side of your home from animals if you back up against lots of vegetation where you have a habitat behind your home. And maintaining a fire-free zone, keeping flammable objects like firewood, propane tanks, and vegetation, or even something as simple as a small two and a half gallon gas can that's stored by your deck or against your house or in another void space on the exterior of your property can, can go a long way in reducing your threats. We encourage everybody to reach out to your local fire departments and ask for a free home ignition assessment, a free home ignition zone assessment. Teams will come out to your home for free and give you a, a checklist of things you can do to better prepare your home for wildfire should you have that threat. How to prevent wildland fires, knowing that 90% of the wildland fires are caused by humans. And that is, that is a unfortunate fact, but a fact that continues to increase. Ensure there are no dragging chains on trailers. We have a lot of activity with transit, with vacationing folks that are maybe um, pulling a RV for the first time during a rented RV for a vacation, and they're not used to pulling it, and they forget that the chains are dragging on the ground. Do not throw cigarette butts out of a car window. Uh, now is not the time to conduct control burns because we are in a burn ban now. If you have a barbecue or you're grilling, ensure that the coals are contained. And if you do use coals, make sure you do not dispose those coals until they're properly extinguished and cool in something like a trash can or something in the corner of your yard. Remember, anything you can do to reduce a spark or an ember will reduce the threat of wildfire. Locally, two-thirds, almost 70% of the wildland fires are in the unincorporated areas outside of the city of Austin. And as a result, we see through this time and through this season an increase. We ask you to stay vigilant. We ask you to be focused on what you're doing. And we ask you to deliver to us feedback of things you're seeing out in the field that we may not see. Establish a relationship with your fire department. Establish a relationship with your HOAs and your neighbors on keeping your community safe from wildfire this year. I want to thank everybody. We're available for questions if anybody has anything. And again, I encourage everybody to go to warncentraltexas.org and sign up for notifications. 
It's warrencentraltexas.org. Warren? Warren. Warren, like. And I can open up for any questions. Uh, Chief, start uh, name, rank, and serial number again. We didn't get that. Sure. Robert Abbott, A B B O T T, Fire Chief with Lake Travis Fire Rescue. You know, you mentioned uh, 2011 with the Steiner Ranch fire. We were just talking about that earlier, right before we all came in. Um, do you see similar situations? You know, the dew points went way down mm -hmm. at that point in time. It's been extremely hot and all that. Are we setting up for another potential of 11 repeat, or we're we not quite there yet? Uh, we're there. We're there. So if you look how we've trended, we, we've gone a period of time with no rain, like we did in 2011. We went many days, weeks, with 100 degree or higher, like we did leading up to the 2011 fire. In addition, we have something that we didn't have back then. We have two large snowstorms or ice storms that created down and dead vegetation throughout the entire community. Now, while our efforts over the last couple months since the last storm were very critical in reducing that fire risk, there's a number of areas that we were not able to get into or, or just preserve land, for example, or areas that are remote but butt up against the wildland urban interface areas that have not been treated yet. So one of the factors that we did not have back in 2011 that we have today is the fact that we're coming out of two significantly vegetation damaging storms, if you will. And uh, while all the communities in the city and the county and all our stakeholders have done an amazing job with that effort, there is still an exorbitant amount of mass and debris that is still in those areas that could pose a higher threat. One of the things that we learned from that event was um, how fire jumps, uh, fast drop is just a huge symbol of mm -hmm. 71. We still have a lot of communities with very, very narrow roadways with tree canopies that are going over the roadways. Uh, what's being done to address that? I mean, it's been almost, you know, it's been 10 years mm -hmm. since that event. Yeah. Has enough been done? Uh, you know, should county officials do more in regards to these roadways? So there's a number of things with roadways uh, and access issues relating to vegetation or even access issues in general uh, relating to means of egress, whether you have two ways in or two ways out of a community. We'll start with the vegetation. Um, we are seeing that the county and the cities are very responsive when notified of trees that are not maintained within roadways and they can usually get them trimmed up within the requirements within a couple days of notification, if not sometimes within 24 hours of that notification. Some of these trees that we're talking about not only pose an issue for fire jumping over a road where it may have been contained on one lot, but the embers jump to the other side or through the canopies, they've connected with the other side of the street, but also emergency vehicle responses. I was talking to firefighters just yesterday about some of the challenges they have of getting the units in to fight the fire based on these trees not being properly maintained. So the county and the cities are very responsive to it. I've never heard that there's been a a uh, report of a uh, tree needing to be trimmed in the easement or that's not on uh, somebody's personal property that hasn't been uh, obtained. The power utility companies are very good about notifying and coordinating trimming around the uh, power lines and that's a thing that is continuing especially after the storms uh, lowering the branch lines against some of these uh, power lines throughout the uh, community. So the efforts there but we need to know about these things. Sometimes there'll be something that was not uh, low hanging and then a branch breaks and now it's low hanging we're just not aware of it so reach out to your local community officials the hoas have a big stake in this they can get a lot of this work done as well or at least notify the communities of low hanging branches or anywhere that would reduce a response coming in now to the to the other part of that question and i don't know if you added it as a question but if you don't mind i'll talk about emergency response in and out access issues if you are in a community, and there are many communities throughout the uh, Travis County area that have one way in and one way out, uh, that's not gonna change simply tomorrow. That's gonna be a long process if your community is working on a second means of egress or an emergency access road. But what people can do is take steps that we've mentioned here, like being prepared, reducing the amount of time it takes you to get to the car, remo remo uh, reducing the amount of time it takes you to get out of the area uh, by having all these things laid out in advance will get you out of the, some of those spots a little quicker. The other thing is we work with local law enforcement should we need to evacuate an area. We can do different traffic flow patterns like contra flow or the, the law enforcement traffic authorities can also change up different routes should we need to do that. A lot of that comes down to notification and that is one question a lot of folks have is how do I get notified of these situations. One, 
there is tremendous work being done through social media outlets, and we know not everybody's on social media, and social media platforms change, but also by s signing up for emergency alerts through the various programs like warncentraltexas.org and any other platform that your community has adopted and uses on a daily basis, communicating factual information. There are times when the public will grab a bit of information and put that on social media platforms. It doesn't contain maybe all of the information it should, or it's just a partial information, or there's some opinion put into that. The challenge that creates for emergency responders and, and uh, professional communicators in the emergency field of communication is that now we're having to go back and correct misstatements. So if you are sharing information, we ask you to share legitimate information from legitimate sources that is timely and make sure that we're not including personal opinion in some of that that could misrepresent or mislead somebody to doing something they should be doing or not doing something. So we ask everybody if you're going to share the information that you share factual information from reliable sources. I just want to talk about air support and how mm -hmm. important that's been and how important it continues to be, especially sure. in those areas that you're talking about. Sure. So locally, we have the benefit of star flight through the county system. They have three helicopters that are obviously fire, aeromedical, and also wildland equipped. We use those uh, when we need to. Uh, they're easily and quickly deployable. It's a great system. Uh, we also are, have partnerships with the Texas Forest Service who have um, air resources stationed throughout the state. Now, the where they're stationed changes almost on a daily or weekly basis depending on demand, depending on threat, uh, and depending on a lot of the things that we talked about earlier with the KDDI index and where fires are more likely to happen versus other areas. So if the northern part of the state had some moisture, some rain for a period of time, it would lessen slightly that, that demand and they may shift resources as a result. And that also includes air resources. So we have helicopters like Starflight and um, the Texas National Guard. They have Blackhawks as well, in addition to what the Fire Service has uh, with a pilot and smaller craft vehicles for scouting missions and so forth. We've got a fire in Wilco right now. Big welding through mm -hmm. that one. Um, another one a couple months ago uh, along San Gabriel. Yes. And that was a welding job. Um, the one over here by China Ranch just a couple days ago, mm -hmm. fireworks. Yes. Um, talk, let's talk about fireworks. First. Sure. Are you just blown away that people are doing this right now? Absolutely. And, and I, and there's a couple things to that. So let's 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 hit on the the what the hot work, the welding. The welding is is part of construction, obviously, and maintenance on things. There are things sometimes that would help wildland if they're welded properly. Fences. Uh, there's other things that need to be welded even during a burn ban. Sometimes we ask those who are welding to ensure that you have created a safe environment for that welding activity. You wet down the area. You have the resources like a hose or extinguisher near you and you take precaution to reduce those, those uh, welding or hot work as they're referred to type incidents. To your point about the fireworks, um, it, we, we have people that will celebrate safely. We always encourage residents to take a, and go watch a professional pyrotechnic event that is usually scheduled and programmed through a, a city or a county or an HOA. If, People are using fireworks that are basically left over from the holidays, specifically July 4th most recently, uh, and they spread that out. Now we have ongoing firework issues throughout the months outside of the selling period for fireworks. It creates a lot of issues. This last fire we had here on um, early Monday morning uh, was ironically very close to my house, and it spread from one lot to the next because embers jumped uh, the road. Uh, there was enough momentum because it was on a slope to where it burned up the side of the hill and then also burned to the left and the right of the properties. Uh, my house was threatened as was the whole community. It was not far from, it was less than a quarter of a mile from where the Steiner Ranch fire in 2011 started. So these are all things that we take very seriously. We ask the community that if fireworks are discharged, that one, they're not be discharged during a burn ban or anything like that. Now there's not a firework ban, to make that clear. But those fireworks, when you're not, when, when, when they are entered into an environment like we have right now, are nothing more than dangerous. And that is, as we saw Monday, a fact. 
Um, we do get a lot of support uh, and we do have open dialogue with the firework industry. They are very aware of this. Uh, during the selling period, they uh, ensured that in our area that all of their selling areas, their, their booths were two code. They were inspected by either Travis County or any of these ESDs behind us. And they're, they know the danger. They absolutely do know the danger. And I think collectively, we can get past the firework things that people just lay low on that uh, until we're in a safer area and a safer time with moisture content and heat. Uh, it also poses all these things, especially fireworks, completely preventable, completely preventable, and it puts a burden on the system. It puts a burden on the fire resources, emergency services, law enforcement, and all the other things that have to support a wildland fire, utilities. So if we start using, losing utilities such as lines, power lines, during a heat wave where people are relying on that power for AC to keep their, uh, keep their homes cool or keep their loved ones cool, that is a huge problem. Completely, completely preventable. So something as small as a firework, a Roman candle, or a mortar can set off a chain of reactions and put demand on the system. If we had uh, Monday's fire here in this community went to two alarms, if we had three two alarm fires in the general community, all systems would be taxed, just based on the demand that's created, especially if these fires would be preventable, such as uh, dragging chains on the ground or fireworks or something, just not paying attention to barbecuing and grilling, so. Any um, resume on that? Do you know who said the perfect job and did that? Yeah, so the individual that we focused on uh, will be cited for that. Um, the people who were involved with that were very uh, cooperative with us. Uh, they realized that it did not go as they had planned and that adult supervision is very important at all hours of the night and that this could happen to any community. It can happen to a well-established community, a master plan community, or it can happen in very rural settings. Uh, no, there's not one community in this area that's immune to all of these threats. There are some communities that are better prepared for them based on how they're laid out, how they're designed, and the continued maintenance that goes into establishing defensible spaces. But nobody is immune to this. And there's a, a feeling that maybe the wild threat out here in this part of Travis County is higher than it is in maybe the other parts of Travis County where it's flatter. And I would tell you that each one has its own challenges uh, relating to the threat of fire and uh, you could have long pastures like you do in Pflugerville and Maynard and out near Elroy in the, in the racetrack or you could come here where everything's on a slope and you have large tr uh, tree canopies that have not seen any water in many, many weeks and are dealing with the heat. So we also look at these things and in, in not just the resources, but the firefighter safety and public safety, the paramedics that respond to these calls as well, in addition to law enforcement that is out there uh, back in 2001, we had a, we had a constable uh, have a medical event on the scene of the Santa Ranch fire. Two days after the fire, we were in the process of repopulating the area after the evacuation. He suffered a medical emergency um, and he died. So we do have fatalities in the public safety realm relating to these calls, maybe not the actual day, but we do have them historically. And we ask that everybody help us um, really take a, uh, a good stance on getting these fires put out when they're small, if they even start. So it's a question that's like, how do you make sure that everybody stays healthy in any situations? Because, you know, we get out for 15 minutes and I'm ready to jump in Barton Springs. And right. I can't imagine what they're going through. So the, the public safety-wise, we encourage everybody to stay hydrated. Uh, we also alter a lot of, especially when the heat index is what it is right now, we do change our daily approach to what we're doing. We may not be out in the field training like we would be when it's cooler for obvious reasons. We have, to, we have to be prepared for that next emergency. We also ensure that the stations and the units are equipped with hydration and snacks should they need to be out for long per periods of time. We've recently secured a specialized designed rehab rehabilitation bus for firefighters, which provides a cool place to go, also in restroom facilities and um, hydration and a number of other things that they can come once it's dispatched to a call, usually sent on a larger incidence where we have a large number of firefighters. But there's different levels of, of uh, protection that we give the firefighters, but there's nothing that a firefighter would like more right now than this everybody play it safe and follow what we talked about today. That would be the biggest thing you could help the firefighters 
and public safety with his display pool. Don't do things that lead to wildfire. Take measures this weekend if you have time, start cleaning up your property. Um, even if you can't get the whole thing knocked out in the entire weekend, a start would be a great thing to do. Was the cost involved? Because if <clears throat> these fireworks, welding, obviously preventable, and then just the cost involved, is there ever any discussions of relating that cost back to the folks who created the so there's a there's a number of thoughts and principles on that is that uh, most of these are preventable but when it comes down to it it is an accident and depending on the threshold of the incident and a uh, number of factors every incident's different and we would through the course of an investigation find if there's any laws broken if there's any violations uh, HOAs are taking a much more aggressive and uh, alert focus on violations of just simple deed restrictions so maybe where there's not a criminal element or a criminal charge uh, possible with a uh, fire that started as a result of an accident, the HOAs, some of them, are taking action against that because it, it may have violated deed restrictions or CCR covenants or something like that. So there's a number of things that we can look at. Um, and then law enforcement always has the ability, should it meet the thre threshold of pressing charges or making a citation to do that. You, you guys have done such a great job saying that. Do you guys want to step forward and say a word real quick? No. <clears throat> Well, um, I think Chief Abbott, hey, uh, Nick Perkins, um, the fire chief at Travis County Emergency Service District Number Two, we're also known as the Pflugerville Fire Department. Uh, I think Chief Abbott covered it really, really well. Uh, I think the big point is that we have a really collaborative and coordinated effort towards wildfire in Travis County. Uh, we're here, we're ready, uh, but as Chief Abbott said, we need help from the public, and we've covered that information. I'm glad you didn't stay right there. I'm glad you came up. His territory, and he touched on this a moment. His territory is like big difference from your territory. Um, so people over there in the Pflugerville area, I almost said Pflugerville, I've been here a long time. Um, sense of strong sense of security. I'm in open area, farmland, I'm okay. That's not true. Because I was up in an area where it's open land, wildfire, it's a wind tunnel, it goes and it goes fast, and I've seen some fires out there. So let's talk about that. People out there in the subdivision, flat land, we're okay. No, they're not, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the terrain is different on the eastern part of the county, Pflugerville, Manor, and down in the southeast area. Uh, we have flat, kind of rolling prairie land, and those are light, flashy fuels. And in the wildfire uh, business, that is one of the greatest threats that firefighters can face because those fires, like you said, move extremely quickly. Um, they can be unpredictable. And so absolutely, there is a threat throughout Travis County, especially on the east side. Um, and you're right, uh, on, on 2011, uh, the fire started in Pflugerville. Uh, so we had a fire within the city limits of Pflugerville and then two other fires burning in far east Travis County. And so um, the threat is everywhere. The other thing I like to emphasize is you may live on the east side, work on the west side. You may work on the west side or live on the west side and work on the east side. So you may be exposed to threats throughout your day that may be different than what you're uh, you, you may be aware of. And so we just ask that everyone take this serious and throughout the county there is risk. What's your advice to folks that live out there in that, that black land community uh, and, and when they see something like this? Because you can see it coming a lot faster and, and you may say, oh, it's okay, it's far, far away, but those things can move fast, right? Uh, whereas here in the uh, in Rolling Hills area, you may not see it or it's close to far away. Um, what's your advice to someone if you see something in the distance that farmland, that ranch land that's down the road, uh, what, should you, what should you do? Yeah, like, like Chief Abbott mentioned, it's, it's having a plan, it's having a go bag, it's having some awareness, making sure you know how to receive alerts. Uh, and then like he also said, we need that feedback from the community. So if you see something, make sure and call 911. You could be the person that's first alerting uh, the emergency system that there's a fire. Okay, that will conclude today's uh, press conference. If there's any other further questions, we have emergency management behind us. We have obviously fire from various resources and, and departments throughout Travis County. If you have any questions, we have a go bag in front of us uh, to give a viewers kind of an example of what they can uh, prepare for should they have to use it. Obviously, it's something that you probably never want to have to use, but if you do use it, 
make sure it's updated and you know where it is and people in your family know how to access it. So on behalf of everybody in Travis County and the surrounding Central Texas area, thank you for your time and uh, we look forward to your participation in making this a safe, safe season. Thank you. Thanks for being with us again on KXAN Live as we brought you that news conference from uh, some of the emergency services districts in the Travis County area. We heard from Lake Travis Fire Rescue as well as uh, Travis County ESD2. Uh, they are sharing information about ways that we can all be safer during these incredibly hot, dry conditions that are persisting in our area. The fire danger is very high. We've reported about a number of fires that have happened in our area out in Llano County, in Williamson County, here in Travis County. So really, uh, this situation is uh, pervasive throughout Central Texas. So uh, they recapped a number of ways that we all can think about how to stay safe out there. You know, don't throw cigarette butts out the window. Watch for any chains that are potentially dragging uh, behind a truck carrying a boat or a trailer or something like that. You can go back and watch this stream live if you want to uh, see those recaps on Facebook as well as our website a little bit later this afternoon. So thank you all again for watching. Again, please stay safe out there. We have information about uh, just how hot it is going to be today and through this weekend. There is a slight chance of rain this weekend, which I know a lot of us would love to see but we have those details if you want to take a deeper dive, in-depth look at the forecast on our website at kxan.com. Thanks again for watching. Will Dupree again in the KXAN live studio. We will see you back here at another time. Hope you all stay safe, healthy, and cool out there. Take care.